under the midday sun, the light of battle shone brightly in the eyes of mad dog Mike Curtis. Number 32 had 11 years of head-on collisions and won almost every one of them. He was a relentless tracker of pass receivers, runners, and quarterbacks. The Mad Dog had all the hunger and hardness a man ever needed to drive him to the top. And he was named to the All-Pro team in only his second season. It was ironic that this future Hall of Fame linebacker came to the Colts at a different position. Mike Curtis was a great football player that I drafted out of Duke University. And to show you how smart I was, I brought him in and made him a fullback. <laughs> and uh, after the first year, it was very evident that Mike Curtis was not an offensive player, he was a defensive player. As a fuzz-cheeked rookie fullback, the first hint of Curtis's fierce nature surfaced in a pregame incident with Baltimore star quarterback Johnny Unitas. I played fullback, and I remember I didn't turn around at the line of scrimmage to catch a ball, and he just rifled the ball in the back of my helmet. Well, it angered me so much that I almost went back and uh, decided to do something about it, but then I remembered I was a rookie, and I couldn't do that because this guy was a great ball player, but I almost punched him out. We used to say that Mike had come out and chew the tires off the bus on the way to the, on the, way to the game. I mean, he was, he was a pretty vicious football player. Never has a man been unhappier the day of a game than uh, he would just get beside himself. He hated uh, the Doris Day, uh, the American flag, black and white saddle Oxfords, his own teammates. He had the disposition of a Highland moccasin. The one thing that would always get me excited was if anybody had anything to say to me. And nobody really talked to me too much because I would look them up throughout the field, wherever the ball was, to chase him down, and then ask him if they had something else smart to say. You got something else smart to say. They got something else, I'd chase him down again. I'd just screw up my plays. And every once in a while, in my zest to get to the ball carry, I forgot, well, you don't have to quite take that angle, or you don't have to do it quite that way, because you have to cover this position. And I would think of that as I was running, then I'd run back and try to get back, so I had a double double move, and then I'd go flying up there out of control to try to kill somebody. Rage was a part of Curtis Anatomy. Like a muscle, he flexed it and built it up. He was called a madman in cleats, a notion that was played up by the sporting press. Here I am, I'm just working hard, trying to do a good job from playing with the team. You're wrong, there's got to be something. Nobody plays like that unless there's some nutbag. Well, I said, okay. If they want something, I'll tell them something. So I made up this, these stories. I got a great thrill of running my bike in the, the uh, brick walls. God, that's great stuff. So that went out. And uh, we had these great BB gun fights. You know, we aimed at each other's eyes. Really? Yeah, yeah shoot all the time. We always had those things. What was not fiction was Curtis's intensity and desire. Characteristics that brought out the madness in his method. And if Mike meant for his body to get 14 hours of sleep, then by golly, he would grasp the bed for 14 hours and stay in a posture. And I knew when he was asleep and when he was, he might not be, he might be awake for eight of those hours. But if I put on deodorant or drop the coat hanger, what did I do? I'm trying to get my rest. He was a lawman on the field and his brand of frontier justice was meted out vividly in a game against the Dolphins. We're winning. Our momentum is significantly better than Miami's. And here comes Mr. Fan, <clears throat> who wants to join in the momentum. Oh, I don't know what he's, but anyway, he was smashed. So he comes running out on the field, great lark, picks up the ball. When I saw him pick it up, I immediately ran over there and knocked him down. Not to hurt him, but to knock him down and get the ball back in the game, get rid of his rear end, period. I didn't think it was a joke that I was working out there. A lot of other guys might think it's a joke to see a fan run out there. To me, it was my job. And after the game, two or three of us were angry. Bubba Smith and I went, went to Mike. He, we said, you shouldn't have done that, Mike. You make us all look bad. He said, that guy broke a city ordinance, and I enforced it. And if he comes back out there again, I'll hit him again. 
He, uh, he was a little to the right of Attila the Hun. But Mike is somewhere to the right of uh, Mussolini uh, in his political views. <laughs> Somebody gave me a doll of John Wayne, the Duke, Mr. All-America, he. So I got him in my office, yeah. <laughs> in Baltimore, Curtis was a hero bigger than any movie star. And like John Wayne Westerns, all action became secondary to the final shootout. Barking his counts, takes it away without a fake, rolling to his left side, sets up and is going to be swarmed under. The ball is free. Baltimore's got it. Racing for the goal line is Mike Curtis. He's for the 15, 10, 5. Curtis scores. Go to war, Miss Agnes. Baltimore's defense just took the ball away from Tap. He led by deeds rather than words. But like the commercial says, when he spoke, everybody listened. All team meetings are a bunch of wigonas. And uh, Mike stood up and said, well, I got something to say. I'm going to tell you something. We're going to win the rest of our games. He said, we got three games left in the season, then we got two playoff games, and then we got the Super Bowl. That's six games. I'm going to play the same way I always play. And everybody in this room is going to go full speed all the time in practice and in the game. Because if you don't, I'm going to whip your butt myself. <laughs>